Hey, what's up everybody? This is Cam FTW, and I'm going to be showing you a quick video on a mantid farm outside of Napui Quarter. Now, this farm takes place just south of Kining Center and factions just outside of the Napui Quarter instance in Weijin Bazaar. It's a relatively quick and simple farm, um, but there's definitely a few tricks that can make this farm a lot easier. So I'll showcase some of those tricks for you guys real quick. And hopefully this will help you guys with your farm. Primarily, I use this farm during holidays or just when I'm bored and want to fill my spare time with something that's a little bit more productive than AFKing and Combadon. So in order to do this farm, you'll need a few things which we'll go over before we get started. First of which is you're going to need a ranger or an assassin that has access to Napui Quarter. Well, this isn't all too far in the mission storyline from Kinding Center. In fact, I think it's just a few missions in. But once you unlock this and you have access to hard mode, you'll be able to do this farm. Um, with that said, the most effective way to do this farm is going to be with the ranger, as you can add traits or attribute points into the expertise trait line, um, which will significantly increase the amount of damage that you can do with whirling defense. Um, this is doable on assassin, however, it just takes a little bit longer to kill the mobs. Uh, but you do gain a little bit extra stability with how long you can maintain shadow form. So they both kind of have their pros and cons. But for the purposes of this video, we'll use a ranger as it is the fastest way. And ultimately you should strive to do this as quickly as possible if you're wanting to maximize your profit. So quickly we'll do a quick breakdown of the skills and equipment that you'll need for this farm. First, you're going to want full blessed insignias. So once you have full blessed insignias in every piece, you'll look at the runes here, which is going to be a plus one plus three with expertise on ranger. On assassin, that's probably going to look like plus one plus three with shadow arts. But for ranger, you're going to want that in expertise. Then you're going to want on ranger a plus two in wilderness survival and then the highest superior Viger that you can afford. Uh, this is doable without superior Viger. However, it does kind of make your health an issue at some points, especially if you don't have a very clean ball and you need to take a little bit of extra time to clean it up. The superior Viger will come in and save you in some instances, which allows you to keep going without many deaths. And then in the last two slots, I just have Vitae runes in there. A little bit of extra help. Again, just for that extra health cushion there. With that said, we're going to take a quick look at the attribute point distribution here. We're going to invest seven points into Beast Mastery. We're going to go the just eight in Expertise, which is going to put that up to a 12 with our plus one plus three on our headpiece. We have the plus two in Wilderness Survival, so we're only going to put this to eight as well. And that's going to get boosted to 10. You're going to want a full plus 12 or a full 12 in Shadow Arts. And then whatever's left, I just threw it in Deadly Arts. That really doesn't make much of a difference, though. And as far as the weapons go, you're just going to want a caster weapon. It doesn't matter if it's ranged or melee. It, all the same, so long as it has the plus 5 energy and the 20% enchantment lasts longer. Then, as far as your shield goes, ideally you're going to want an armor plus 10 versus piercing damage, as that's what the damage you take here is. And then a plus 30 or a plus 45 while enchanted handle on that. So once you have the equipment, you have the character, and you have the location all unlocked, at this point you're able to do the farm. So I'm going to showcase what this looks like. And along the way, I'm going to be trying to explain exactly what we're going to be doing and things you want to keep an eye out for. But first, I'm going to show you how to set up the farm. So to start, once you know that you're ready to go, you're going to go outside to Weijin Bazaar. Again, make sure that you have hard mode enabled for this. As normal mode, the mobs kind of scatter and they have very unpredictable behavior and you can't actually pull them to get them all stacked up where they need to be. If you're intending on doing more than one run of this, you're going to want to actually anchor your position next to the gate. So for those of you who don't know what that means, it means that right once you leave, 
to the instance you're going to be farming, you're going to want to run directly back in to the city or the outpost and then back out. What that's going to do is when you resign or if you die and you get sent back to town, that's going to spawn you right there by the gate, which minimizes the amount of running you have to do within the outpost and you can get more farms in per hour. So right off the bat, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cast Dwarven Stability and Shroud of Distress. Dwarven Stability, we only need it for the start, and Shroud of Distress, we need up indefinitely. However, we have 54 seconds on that with 12 Shadow Art um, attribute distribution. So what that means is that once we cast Shroud of Distress, I have a 54 second window that I need to spike all of the mobs down in. Now, if you're a little bit new, you're still learning, it might be a good idea to hold Shroud of Distress till before you cast your shadow form, um, just so your window isn't cut quite so short. However, once you get used to it, you can cast it here at the start like I'm gonna do. And the natural stride is gonna be your main movement skill. And so you're going to be using this to get to the point where you're actually aggroing the mobs as well. So I cast Dwarven Stability, Shroud of Distress, and then instantly cast Natural Stride and start running towards the area that we want to actually reach the enemies. As soon as Natural Stride comes up again, we're going to cast it. It should be right at the end of the bridge here. So we cast it again. And now here's the first groups of enemies. These are actually two separate mobs, and you can cheat a little bit to help your Shadow Form window by working along this edge if possible. You won't always be able to get this far along, but sometimes you can. And then you're gonna cast Deadly Paradox, Shadow Form, and Natural Stride, and that's the last time you'll use Natural Stride for mobility. Aggro them all, and place a, sh a Shadow of Haste right there at that corner. Gonna go all the way back into this corner, and then cast Shadow Form once it's up again. Now you use Natural Stride, to teleport back to your Shadow of Haste Tether. And you can see that they all ball pretty well. From here, you're gonna to wanna to use Edge of Extinction and then Whirling Defenses. Since Whirling Defense is a stance, you can actually cast that while Edge of Extinction's up. Now that was kind of a little bit of a weird animation with their death. However, the reason why they all die is because of the Spirit of Extinction that you cast. And I'll run through this a few more times just to show a little bit of the variability that you might get from pole to pole and how you can best handle that. Um, so each time I might give a little bit less information on exactly what skills you're using and more attention towards the specifics of how the mobs are laid out and ways that you can best make sure that you actually get the spike off cleanly. And so since we set that tether by leaving the instance and then re-entering it, we can just resign, then it'll put us right back, ready to go. Now I recently did a video where I maximized the survivor title using only this farm. In fact, it wasn't quite a video, it was more of a stream session that I did. And we were able to easily do it within just two streams. And each stream was only about two hours long. So this slash resign does not actually count as a death. And so you can safely do that if you're planning on experience grinding for the survivor title as well. But right once you get back to this point, you're just going to want to go right back out to the instance and do it again. Again, I'm going to use Dwarven Stability, Shroud of Distress, and then you get two natural strides in before you engage. So that was the first one there. The second one will be right here at the end of the bridge. Again, it looks like we can cheat along this edge. Sometimes you might have to engage them early and you just have to use your Deadly Paradox Shadow Form and start running before you have Natural Stride for that third one. The DP, Shadow Form, and then I have Natural Stride again. I want to aggro those two groups, this group, and I swing a little bit wider here. I don't want to get this group. Now I kind of hesitate there for a split second before running to the spot where I put my Shadow of Haste Tether. And that's to allow that far group to actually progress a little bit more towards where I'm at before I continue on. There can be some issues with the monitor ball if the monitors are against that far wall before you actually get them pulled back and over in. Again, always start with rolling defenses, especially on Ranger. As, or always start with Edge of Extinction, sorry. 
on Ranger, as rolling defenses will kill these enemies much, much quicker than if you're using the Assassin variant of this. And you can run into an issue if you pop Edge of Extinction too late, that it won't be off by the time rolling defenses starts killing the first of the enemies here. As you can see, we got a Celestial Weapon here. That's kind of one of the more sought-after weapon skins that drop from this. You can also get Monstrous Eyes, uh, which can be quite valuable, and then Tomes as well. There's also often a chest that will spawn over along this part that has a chance of dropping Celestial Weapons as well. And so it's worth bringing some extra lockpicks just in case you do run into one of those. So this time, I'll try to showcase a little bit of what I mean by stopping to let that far mob actually approach you a little bit. But it is something that you actually need to, to think about before you do. You don't have a lot of time, especially if you're casting Shroud of Distress back here, or if you have to cast Shadow Form early when you engage the first mob. Those are windows that you need to consider when you're doing this farm, and that allows you to determine how much time you actually have to polish things up, make sure things are nice and clean, or if you have to just kind of go for it and work with what you can do. So again, Dwarven Stability, Shroud of Stress, but you can save that if you want to. And then a natural stride right away. There's our first of two before we're going to be using Deadly Paradox and Shadow Form. We use the second natural stride right here. And as you can see, these enemies are actually a little bit closer, but I can still probably squeeze around them. But for the sake of this one, I'm just going to cast it early. So I have to cast it back here. No natural stride available, so I run until it's up, and then I use it. Be sure you aggro both the groups here. We're going to get the one there and the one there. So I kind of wait. And those drones don't matter too much if they're against that far wall. What I mean by the far wall is back there. It's just the monitors that can create issues there. Get all the way to the corner if possible. If you need to cast Shadow Form and then finish getting to the corner, that's perfectly fine. I try to tuck around here as well, which helps limit some of the damage I take, and then it also helps ball those drones in perfectly. And you run right up. You always try to find the middle of where you're attacking, or where the ball is, and go for that. And then as you can see, to end that off, I just use the Edge of Extinction and whirling defense. With that, it's pretty simple. Um, the amount of gold per hour isn't insanely high with this kind of a farm. In fact, there's probably other farms like the Vatir farm, which yield higher uh, gold on identified drops per hour. However, this is one that's very easy and quick to set up. As you saw, it didn't really take too long to get set up. You don't need to be very far in the campaign at all. You just need access to hard mode as normal mode won't work for this. And it can be especially lucrative during holidays where you're trying to farm other festival drops as well. But outside of the holidays, it's not all too bad of a farm either. Anyways, just from streaming, I've had a number of people come in and ask for a little bit of an explanation on how this farm works. And so I figured I'd put together a quick video guide to illustrate some of the different techniques and tips and tricks that you can use to actually get this farm through uh, the points where you could even farm your own rank three survivor if that's what you desire anyways i hope that this guide helped um, please be sure to check me out on twitch as well as youtube i'll be trying to do a few more videos as we continue to go um, through our playthrough in guild wars and find things that might be worthwhile to make videos on so if you have any suggestions for that, feel free to drop those in the comments below. And if you would like to um, see more, ask more, interact more on a more live basis, then be sure to also follow me at twitch.tv slash camftw. All right, with that, I hope that this helps a lot, and I hope to see you guys again soon. So thank you very much, and have a great rest of your day.